All right, thanks a lot. Um, it's exciting to give a talk again <laughs> uh, in front of some people, um, and ironically on the presence of absence in a mostly empty ballroom. Um, so no, it's not too bad, actually. Got like some people here. Uh, as um, Daniel said, I'm Anthony from Penn State, and I'm going to talk to you today about thinking about how we represent what might be missing on our maps. Um, I'll start by talking more broadly about visualizing the presence of absence, which is something I've written a little bit about a couple years ago before we ended up um, living it hard. Um, to begin, I'm, I'm coming from an area of thinking about how we have lots of interesting pervasive spatial data. We've seen a lot of examples even in this, this session. Um, incredible depth of uh, analytical capabilities from what we can understand about neighborhoods, uh, from demographic and satellite data. Um, that makes me think a lot about what's missing and absent in those sources. You know, um, uh, what, what don't we see on these maps? For example, when tens of millions or billions of people stay home a lot, um, there's a sudden decrease in activity that we might expect that I think is interesting to imagine as something that should be salient on a map. This is a pretty old idea. Lots of other people before me have thought about this, uh, Hagerstrand in particular, in the 70s wrote about how geographers should maybe pay more attention to what's not present on maps. The other reason that I'm interested in this is from a perceptual um, approach, and that's because we use negative space in cartography all the time. And if you just don't show something, if you show missing data by not rendering anything, that's a problem. Um, in this super simplified example, it may be easy to find the donut hole there and say, well, it looks like we're missing some data. But imagine um, uh, this applied to a raster in a scattered kind of manner, which you're going to see in a little bit. It's really hard to separate these things out perceptually. There's also a fundamental perceptual issue with how we interpret um, missingness like this. So uh, visual search asymmetry suggests that it's much easier for you to identify the mark on the left that has the presence of an attribute versus finding the one on the right that's missing something. Um, it should have taken you a little bit more time to do that right task there. So this means that if we just don't draw stuff, that's not going to be readily apparent to most readers. That's just a fundamental um, fact with how we look at things. I'm also inspired by um, some of the things we see and experience in the world and trying to make this connection a little bit more explicit about what does it look like when something's missing. Um, empty bag of chips, of course, that's very sad. Um, residue on a table, uh, I like this jet bridge example, like looking at where like, something has been placed a lot of times, right? Kind of where um, you can see this in different things in our environment and you can also notice when something's missing. So I did some work a while ago um, looking at just basic visual variables and how this might be applied in this case to um, vacant lot properties in Detroit. And you can make you know things look magenta, make a hot color and draw attention. You might desaturate. Um, blurring seems to be kind of an interesting way of, of looking at vacancy in this case. Um, it's still there, but it's not in use in the normal way. Um, shadows, I think, have an obvious kind of affordance of absence that I'm going to explore a little bit further today. Uh, so it's in the context of this broader uh, thinking about visualization of absence that I started working in the last uh, year and a half or so on some COVID-19 stuff with uh, biologists who are looking at the impact of behavioral intervention on people's movement and can we detect this kind of stuff and, um, from various methods. One of those methods is looking at nighttime lights and one of the places we've started to look at is uh, the Republic of Korea. So nighttime lights are a fun thing that lots of us have experienced with or seen before. Um, Veers is one of the major sources of this type of data. And these are satellite remote sensing sources that give us some sense of changes in uh, nighttime light visibility. Those changes are actually in practice really hard to, to disaggregate from changes in seasonality, uh, weather, and in some cases we can find instances where human behavior may have actually driven some change. So one of the questions that um, the epidemiologists I've been working with uh, were interested in was like, can we actually use this stuff to see the impact of a behavioral intervention? So a country or a place saying, hey, stop going outside your house so often, uh, maybe don't go to recreational facilities. Can we actually pick that up on these kind of passive um, space-based um, methods? So a little bit of context for um, at least uh, some part of last year in South Korea was that South Korea implemented some very aggressive strategies to curb the spread of coronavirus and were successful with that without doing what we would consider more like spatially located lockdowns. It focused a lot more of its attention on uh, thinking about sectors of behavior and modifying behavior within those areas in particular, rather than like a geographic 
uh, spatial proximity kind of approach like you might see, for example, in Australia. So uh, here's an example of uh, kinds of the maps that I started playing around with with my colleagues. Um, one of the really tricky things about nighttime lights is that year over year, you actually usually see a little bit of increase. <laughs> So uh, people construct new things. Uh, the pace of global development generally means that if you look from last year to this year, anywhere in the world, you almost always see a little bit more brightness. Um, so January 2020, this is basically pre-pandemic in Korea versus January 2019. This is the Seoul area and, and kind of surrounding uh, spots, slightly brighter. That's kind of, that's, that's like the default. Um, it does get interesting when we look at December. We're now at the end of the year, the end of the first year of the pandemic, and we do now see in Seoul a place that we would expect to have gotten a little bit brighter. We now have lots of areas where there's kind of scattered decreases in these nighttime light visibility. And this is, you know, month to month. This is winter, uh, winter months. So it drew our attention um, in particular to one of these areas. Uh, there's these blobs that are like ex extremely dark compared to previous years. So that got me uh, pretty fired up because I was like, wow, this is actually like a noticeable, <laughs> interesting difference here. What's going on there? It looks like it's in the, like the middle of nowhere. Where is that? Um, I don't know much about Korea, so I started to learn. Um, did what most people do and threw on the satellite later and started playing around. And what do you think these are? Does anybody have any guesses in the audience here? Airport? That's a good guess. Military? Getting close. Kind of. Ski resorts. Yes. Yeah. So this is awesome. This is the thing that's normally like super bright snow. It's like got high albedo, right? It's high reflectance. Um, and what we found is this is uh, Phoenix Snow Park in Pyeongchang. This is one of the areas um, that hosted uh, the Olympics a few years ago. Uh, South Korea had, an, in, in fact, implemented a behavioral change on this kind of uh, activity. So we're going to close down ski resorts. Um, we're, we're trying to avoid doing, quote, lockdowns more broadly, but we're going to take out this sector of activity. And this is one of the rare examples, I would say, of where we actually saw a meaningful uh, absence kind of emerge, right? A place that was really bright that kind of turned off the lights for a while. Um, you sort of need something that severe, in our experience, at least working with this data so far, to use them for this purpose. So I started thinking about other ways to show this. I was playing around there with just a simple diverging scheme just to see what we could understand from it. Um, and then I got, went way down a rabbit hole of blending modes. And I don't know how many of you have had the uh, serious mispleasure of looking at like a 30 minute video on YouTube about how all the blending modes work, but uh, you're welcome. If you do that later today or something, sorry, I made you do that. Uh, it's very hard to actually, for me anyway, to understand them. But one of these methods I really got interested in was this overlay blend, um, in particular because I think it kind of helps me um, do what I want to do with this, which is to highlight places where I have information a little bit better, maybe selectively reveal uh, an underlying layer and kind of push back where I don't know things. And this is speaking a little bit to this absence, uh, a question about like maybe not overselling what I know versus what I don't know. Um, and overlay blending, I think, is kind of an interesting mode. We have these crude rasters. That's what you get when it was something like fears. That's as good as it's going to get. Um, I experimented with making these like diverging. We've got like positive and negative changes. This is the area of Chuncheon in South Korea, which had a lot of these like high and low changes within one city within a year. Um, the one I was happiest with was this particular mode, which really uh, basically turns this change layer into grayscale. And what you see on the left is that over top of a vector map, and on the right is over top of an image background. And so what I'm trying to do with my colleagues here is just draw their eyes in on the actual places that where we have something notable going on. So I'm trying to get them to stop looking at this whole super complicated thing and really, really winnow in on something that maybe is a little bit more meaningful within an area. Obviously, these maps need a lot more context to do things with, but this is kind of an entry point for, again, thinking about biologists who tend to look at the world through graphs. Um, so this is a struggle to get them to think about more creative ways to visualize things. Um, I got a little crazier with it, and I don't think this works, but I just wanted to show you because it's nasus. Um, hybrid blending where, uh, I, I don't know if this, somebody, I'm sure someone else has done this before, but I decided to like use that pixel layer to reveal a different base map. <laughs> um, I think if you design things properly, maybe did like a really gentle hill shade and like a properly designed vector layer, you could use sort of selective details um, uh, to do some revealing, and that would be kind of interesting, um, but this just looks nuts. Um, so. In the few minutes I have left here, think about some of the challenges that come along with this. 
And um, I appreciated the chance to actually fly here and sit on the plane and uh, think about something, uh, which is something I haven't done in a long time. Um, and I started thinking about, you know, what I could add to this talk. I was uh, thinking about Firefly mapping, and I made a crude example of that here on the left here. What's like the inverse of Firefly mapping? Like, what if I want points of darkness? Um, and so I made that example here in the middle. That's kind of like, imagine if I have traffic cameras that go offline or something, I want to see like a point of shadow. Uh, so maybe that's the black fly method. Um, and then going further along the fly metaphor, which no one should ever do, um, the one on the right here, I started thinking about like, what if my default is that I don't know anything about the world and I've got points of observation that I'm able to make. And maybe I'm poking a hole through the cloud layer to see what's underneath it. So this is kind of like the bot fly method of mapping. Um, if you don't know what a bot fly is, it's a thing that buries under the skin and has a little thing, a uh, little like way to breathe outside of your skin. So I'm sorry if you have to Google that and learn about it too. Um, but uh, maybe we need a more elegant way to describe this particular thing. But the sort of selective reveal again being a method that we could play with, with um, helping communicate absence. Like these are places I have observations. Like look how little this is. And we think we tend to kind of oversell uh, how much how much observe, observe observational power we have. Uh, in many of our data sets. I'm inspired too by thinking about other uh, types of maps and mapping things I've seen in the last year and a half. Um, this particular example comes from a company called Video Mining, which takes all of the surveillance camera fo uh, footage from inside pharmacies and grocery stores and tries to sell like business analytics stuff off of that. Um, so they make these uh, really fun looking heat maps of traffic through a store, but their findings uh, in this blog post that I was reading about are really interesting. They're talking about how um, if people are making fewer trips that are taking longer to stock up on items. They're mostly buying, they're buying from end caps and not spending time in the aisle. Nobody's lingering. Uh, shoppers are coming in smaller groups with 74% solo trips. This has got to be a more conspicuous change in sort of absence, right? This is a grocery store that now has like way fewer people, but they're taking longer and they're operating in different ways. And it's being represented with this crazy heat map thing, which just doesn't at all convey that negative change, right? Um, so how do we do this? Like, obviously we're, we're missing some methods here uh, for showing this. And the uh, work I've been doing with biologists, um, we've been looking at phases of, of uh, restriction, behavioral restriction locally in Center County, Pennsylvania, where we had green, yellow, and uh, red phases, unfortunately. So I was successful at getting different saturation colors in our final paper, uh, but we've literally needed to use green, yellow, and red. We had to use a stoplight scheme. Uh, we're looking at mobile, um, mobile phone data from SafeGraph, and I want to draw your attention to the area under the curve here. This is the uh, sort of difference in normal visit counts, uh, 2019 and 2020. There's this huge drop off in people going places, and we don't have a good way to deal with that over time. So the temporal change of absence is another thing where we tend to make animations and other types of maps that really highlight emergent phenomena rather than the de decline in something. And finally, I think that there's um, a lot of interesting work that can be done with interaction here. Um, I, I tend to like these examples, like the swipe map here. This is Joshua Stevens' um, example from NASA, uh, from some winter weather blackouts in the Houston area, where you can swipe back and forth and kind of see these changes together. I'm not aware, and maybe somebody can um, teach me a little bit more about what empirical work has been done with this particular technique, uh, but I'm not sure that we really understand yet if that works. <laughs> um, we know that it's very hard for people to detect change in animated map, animated map scenes and even self-directed animation is difficult and this is kind of a form of that. Uh, so I'm a little skeptical that it's gonna work that great but I also don't know that we have other ways that are really good for helping us look at uh, sort of absence as an interactive uh, feature. More broadly, I think there's this problem of visual search asymmetry and mapping that we gotta address somehow because we use negative space to help design maps and we're overlaying data on top of that. We cannot use emptiness as a, as a visual variable or else we get those things in conflict with each other. I think there's lots of other potential visual representation types. I'm interested in shadows and how we uh, implement darkness a little bit more into how we deal with our techniques. And I, I think that will speak to this final question, which is I need to learn though, whether or not people actually perceive of that as something qualitatively different. Like, should it just be a hot color? <laughs> it probably works just as well to do that. I just uh, can't help but wonder if there's not something there in terms of um, using um, maybe some other uh, representation of absence that we see in the, in the lived experience that might work uh, just as well. So 
Thanks a lot for your time. If you're interested in this kind of work, um, there's an ICA meeting coming up in Florence uh, uh, pretty soon, and um, I co-chair the Commission on Visual Analytics there, so this kind of research happens at ACES as well at ICA. All right, thanks a lot for your time. Awesome, thank you so much, Anthony. Uh, we have time for one or two questions. For those of you listening at home, not a question, but there's a disturbing video online <laughs> on the Slack, apparently. I'm really sorry. <laughs> it's a great morning session. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I don't have a maybe a question, but maybe a comment. Do you see? Oh, let's yeah, let's go with the hand first. So the question is, uh, why why do you use this interactivity um, for the slider? Yeah, it's a great question, and I think that's that's why I would like to test something like this because I share your concern that it's probable, if not likely, that just showing two things next to each other, showing the difference, is sufficient rather than the swipe. Um, this seems like it's a pretty good method of doing this little change detection. You see it very commonly on like hazard maps showing like before and after disasters. People like get into this um, kind of swiping action to look at it. It's self-directed then, so it's not, does it has maybe fewer problems than a like unpaced or a previously paced animation. Um, but I'm, I'm also skeptical that it's better. <laughs> and I mean that in a way that's not just subjectively more interesting to users, but do people actually learn from the, um, more effectively. I suspect with maybe two things, uh, it's fine when we get into longer term temporal changes with multiple scenes, then obviously having lots of small multiples also becomes really hard to track. Uh, so I, I think it probably depends a lot on the task and I think that would be a really good thing for um, hopefully a future graduate student to work on and study. Cool. Well, technically we are finished with the session. Uh, if there are any burning questions for Anthony, go ahead and bug him afterwards. Thank you, Thank you all. Have a good rest of your nasus.